This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. I want to show you something. Check this out. Sounds weird, right? It's a minor triad with an added note a half step above the root. But this is no ordinary chord. It's a magical chord because this chord contains everything. I should probably explain. When I say this chord contains everything, what I mean is that it contains every interval, or at least every interval that exists in standard tuning. But how is that possible? I mean, if we look at it, the distance from the bottom note to the top is only a perfect fifth, and there's intervals that are larger than that. Clearly this chord doesn't contain, say, a major sixth, right? It just wouldn't fit. But this is where we need to draw the line between a chord and a voicing. A chord is the set of notes you're playing, but a voicing is how those notes are arranged. Like this and this both contain E, F, G, and B, making them the same chord, but in the second one, we spread the notes out more, playing a lower G and a higher F, so it's a different voicing. That lower G is important, though, because it puts it below the E, making a major sixth, so while the first voicing we played didn't have that interval, the chord still does. But let's take a closer look at what we just did. We said that even though this G and this G sound different, they're actually the same thing. And that shouldn't be too surprising. Musicians do this all the time. We call it octave equivalency, and it works because notes an octave apart sound so similar that our ears process them as belonging to the same category, which we call a pitch class. It's kind of like the difference between chords and voicings. Any particular G is a pitch, but if you take all the Gs you could possibly play in all the octaves from subsonic to beyond the highest notes we can hear, you'd have a pitch class, and all the notes in that class would be, for the purposes of this discussion at least, exactly the same. This means we can do a thing called inversion, which is where we take an interval and turn it upside down. Like, our initial voicing had E below G, giving us a minor third, but if we move the G down so it's on the bottom, we wind up with a major sixth, and the same thing always happens with these two intervals. If you take a pair of pitch classes that in one configuration form a minor third, you can always rearrange them to form a major sixth instead, and vice versa. The two intervals are fundamentally linked by inversion, which means that if we're not worrying about octave, there is no difference between them. And we can expand this to wider intervals too. If we take our minor third and move the G up another octave, we get a minor tenth, which is, again, identical. So much like all the different pitches an octave apart form a pitch class, all the intervals connected by inversion form what's called an interval class. Major sixths are minor thirds, or at least they are when we don't care about octaves. But how many interval classes are there? Well, let's try the experiment. We'll start with E. The smallest interval we could add on top would be the minor second, F. A little bigger is the major second, then the minor third, major third, perfect fourth, tritone, and... Well, the perfect fifth would be B, but if we drop that B down an octave, we see it's a perfect fourth below our starting note, and we already covered fourths. If we keep getting larger, we'll just keep running into more inversions of the intervals we already have, which means that in total, on a standard piano, there are only six interval classes. Everything else is redundant. Okay, so we've got our six interval classes. Can we find a chord that has all of them? Yeah, that's easy. Check it out. If we just use all the notes, we're definitely going to wind up with all the intervals. Problem solved, video over, thanks for watching. But wait, that's a pretty unsatisfying answer, so let's reframe the question. What's the smallest chord with all the interval classes? Well, we're going to need a chord with at least six intervals total, so how small can that be? If we only have one note, that's zero intervals, which is slightly less than six. Adding a second note connects the two, giving us our first actual interval. If we add a third note, it connects to each of the ones before it, giving us two new ones for three total, and a fourth note connects to each each of the three previous ones for a total of six. So great, we need at least four notes to include all the interval classes, but just because it's theoretically possible doesn't mean a successful arrangement actually exists. To prove that, we're gonna have to build one. We'll start with a tritone. We're gonna need one eventually, and tritones are symmetrical, which means they invert to themselves, so we don't have to worry about how they're arranged. It's the same either way. Next, let's try adding a minor third. Why a minor third? Well, because it's exactly half a tritone, which means the two can't overlap. We started with F and B, so so if our minor third is, say, F and A flat, then we automatically wind up with another minor third from A flat to B. Or, okay, technically that's an augmented second, and I'm sure some folks are already running to the comments to correct me, but we're talking about interval classes here, so I cannot stress enough how little that distinction matters. What does matter is that if our minor third and our tritone overlap, we're forced to spend two of our precious intervals on the same interval class, and since we've only got six of each to work with, we just can't afford that. However, this actually reveals something interesting. Interval classes 
does come with a sort of built-in tritone equivalency. That is, because tritones are symmetrical, if two notes are a tritone apart, then if you add a pitch a certain interval class away from one of those notes, you can always predict how far it'll be from the other one. We'll call this semi-inversion. It's not a real thing, and it has no impact on how you actually hear these intervals, but it's gonna be useful, so let's pretend it exists. As we just saw, the minor third semi-inverts to itself, which is why we can't include any notes a minor third away from our tritone. The other four interval classes split up into two pairs, the minor second semi-inverts to the perfect fourth, and the major second semi-inverts to the major third. So if we just position our minor third so that each of its notes is either a minor or a major second away from one of the tritone notes, the rest of the intervals will just take care of themselves, which brings me to the really good news. There is no way to not do that. As long as the minor third and the tritone don't intersect, the resulting chord will always contain all six interval classes. This means there's actually four different ways of accomplishing our goal. There's this chord, which is the minor triad with an added half step we saw at the beginning, this one, a major triad with an added tritone, this one, which is like a dominant seventh chord but the third's been replaced with a tritone, and this one, which is a major sixth chord with a third swapped out for a flat two. Together, these are known as the all interval tetrachords. Tetrachord means a chord with four notes, and all interval means, well, you can probably figure that out yourself. Still though, it's a bit of a mouthful, so for the rest of this video, I'm just gonna call them everything chords. They're like everything bagels, but for harmony. And these chords are actually, again, connected in pairs. We're doing a lot of pairing this episode, aren't we? That's set theory for you. They'd reduce all of music to a single mathematical constant if they could. Anyway, in this case, we pair them based on the intervals between consecutive notes. Like in the first chord, going from the bottom, we have a minor second, a major second, and a major third, whereas in the second one, we've got a major third, a major second, and a minor second. Hold on, that's the same intervals. Now, this isn't just a different voicing. There's no way to shuffle these notes around in octaves to get from one chord to the other, but they're still connected by... Remember how I said that flipping an interval upside down was called inversion? Well, we also use that term for flipping chords upside down. This minor flat 9 chord is an inversion of the major sharp 4, and while it's a bit harder to see because of the voicings I used, the other two everything chords are inversions of each other too. Quick side note, some of you may find that confusing because usually when we talk about inverting a chord, we don't mean turning the whole thing upside down, we just mean taking a note other than the root and putting it in the bass. Basically, it's a different voicing, and yeah, that's also an inversion. Unfortunately, different branches of theory sometimes use the same word to mean slightly different things. It's a natural result of hundreds of years of theorists inventing their own models and defining their own terms to describe them. At this point, there's not a whole lot we can do about it without just building a new vocabulary from the ground up, and don't get me wrong, plenty of theorists have tried that, but what they wind up doing instead is just introducing yet another competing set of terms we all have to learn, so for now, the best thing we can do is just accept that inversion can mean two related but different things depending on context. Anyway, tangent over. One thing I find fascinating about the everything chords is that even though by definition they contain some gnarly intervals, they actually don't sound that bad. I mean, I wouldn't call them consonant, but they have a clear sense of structure to them that not every random collection of notes has. Heck, the first pair are literally a major and a minor triad just with added notes. You can even find them both in the major scale. I tried swapping them into classic chord progressions like the doo-wop changes, and it feels... Well, not pretty exactly, but intentional. It's challenging, but not chaotic. You can understand what it's trying to do. Or maybe I've just spent too much time listening to these chords while working on this video, so my ears have started hearing them coherently as a defense mechanism. That's a very real possibility. Feel free to let me know if that's what's happening in the comments. But more than just grafting them onto existing progressions, everything chords open up new compositional possibilities. If you stick with just one for the entire song, you can explore a rich melodic landscape full of different interval options while tying it together with a string strict harmonic identity. On the other hand, you could do what renowned modernist composer Elliot Carter did and string together a series of different everything chords to make a progression. This is aided by the fact that each of them shares at least two notes with 18 other everything chords, so while any given chord may sound rough on its own, the transitions between them can be super smooth. But honestly, I know these chords aren't gonna be everyone's cup of tea. Still though, even if you don't write anything with the everything chords, I think they're worth knowing about. Music theory is a useful tool for composition, sure, but that's not all it is. It's about ideas, it's about models, and while the sounds of these chords might not inspire you, the structure of them is beautiful. I mean, come on, it's a chord that has exactly one of every interval. How cool is that? If, like me, you're feeling trapped at home these days, you're probably looking for more stuff to watch, and if so, let me recommend Nebula. It's a video platform some friends and I built, featuring lots of YouTube's top educational creators, including Polyphonic, Lindsay Ellis, Braincraft, and Volksgeist. We built it as a place to try new things, and some of the more adventurous folks have even made full 
full-length documentaries, including one from Wendover Productions about the world's most useful airport, and another from my friend Dave Whiskus that takes an absurdly deep look at the story of Edith, the sunglasses that became a major character in Spider-Man Far From Home. Seriously, Dave spent months researching all the sunglasses in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the results are awesome. And speaking of documentaries, we've also partnered with CuriosityStream to offer you an even better deal. If you sign up for CuriosityStream with a link in the description, not only do you get a free month of premium access to all their amazing documentaries, including personal favorites like Stradivarius, which tells the story of one of history's most renowned instrument makers, and Can a Computer Write a Hit Musical, which answers the question in its title, you'll also get access to Nebula totally free for as long as you remain a CuriosityStream member. That's two platforms worth of stuff to watch free for a month, and after that, sticking around is super affordable, with annual plans starting under 20 bucks a year. Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patrons, Duck and Howard Levine. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.